Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Lloyd E. Douglas. Mr. Douglas is an independent consultant. From 1984 to 2008, he worked at the NSF, and while there, oversaw a large increase in the REU program uh, in the Division of Mathematical Sciences. He also managed the uh, Mathematical Sciences postdoctoral fellowships, served on the coordinating committee for NF NSF's career program, and co-chaired the implementation committee for the NSF's advanced program. So even if you haven't met Lloyd personally, uh, you might well recognize his name from an NSF program solicitation, and uh, your position wherever you are has certainly been impacted uh, by his work. Mr. Douglas received NSF's Meritorious Service Award in 2007, uh, uh, a certified research administrator. He is the former associate director of the Office of Contracts and Grants at UNC Greensboro. Before going there, he was assistant to the vice president for research at the University of Nevada, Reno. Mr. Douglas is a former vice former first vice president of the MAA and has served as its governor at large for mathematicians in business industry and government, as well as a member of its distinguished lecture series committee. He is the principal investigator on MAA's uh, national research experience for undergraduates program, whose goal is to support the participation of mathematics undergraduates from underrepresented groups. We are so glad for the chance to hear his talk today. Who needs diversity anyway? Let's give Mr. Douglas a warm Zoom welcome. Thank you, Justin. I um, would also like to add my thanks that, to Matt um, for attending this conference, particularly staying until the end of attend this talk. Uh, I also want to thank the organizers, not only for inviting me to be part of this stellar group of presenters, for which I am humbled, but also for their willingness to provide this forum to discuss important issues of which I applaud literally. Um, before we begin this session, I'd like to go over the ground rules. Um, so rule number one is that no subject is off limits. I have a few points that I wanna make and I invite you to discuss them, but if there are other things you, you'd like to talk about, I'm willing to do so. I think it's more important for me to talk about whatever it is you wanna talk about. I could talk forever about all of these subjects. Uh, I think we've gotten to where we don't feel that we can talk about certain things, um, but I want this to be a place where we can do that. Um, the second ground rule is that if I say something that you don't like or you disagree with, um, feel free to challenge me. You may have had a different experience than I have had or have a different opinion, and I'd rather have a discussion about it than have you leave the session saying, oh, this guy's know what he's talking about, and the session was a waste of my time. So if we discuss and listen, then I think we can possibly learn from each other. I learn things just about every day, which is good for me. So the way this session will go is that I'll make some remarks. Um, I'll try to keep them brief, or at least brief for me. But um, then I want to hear your thoughts and answer your questions. I really want this to be more of a dialogue among the participants. It's a little risky on my part, but I've been known to take some risk. So let me begin by saying what I mean when I talk about diversity. And some of these axes of diversity have become pretty traditional by now. Race, sex, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, age, pregnancy, immigration status. More broadly though, I, I, I live here in Reno, Nevada and I've worked on some work with the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada. And I like some of the things that they include. When they talk about diversity, they talk about culture, ethnicity, gender expression, geography, height, language, marital status, veteran status, body weight. There are all, all kinds of things that we can talk about where people sort of discriminate against other people for not having some, some certain characteristic. Um, one aspect of diversity that's not on that list that I like to discuss is level of education. Some of this was brought up by Herbert Medina in yesterday's panel but you know, it wasn't that long ago when in mathematics, um, in the mathematics community that undergraduate, the term undergraduate research was an oxymoron, right? So um, the thinking was that the body of knowledge required to do research in math isn't gained until after the nth year of graduate school where N is greater than three. Um, in a relatively short period of time, 
we've gone from that to hearing from many, many graduate school directors um, that they don't even accept students into their program if they haven't had undergraduate research experience. Um, we've had undergraduate research conferences and more and more we've had undergraduates uh, presenting at traditional research conferences. I was even at a meeting when I overheard somebody say that something I'd never heard, thought I'd hear in my lifetime of, there are too many students here. Like, oh, wow, really? You know, I, I thought I'd never hear that, right? So, so it's, it's, we've done this um, in a relatively short period of time, like I said. So my point is that dramatic change like this can happen, but if we only if we want it to happen. So who has benefited by the inclusion of undergraduates that are into those who are doing research? Well, the students did, of course, and, but I claim that mathematics has benefited the most because of their inclusion. Our discipline is much richer because of this inclusion. Um, I think in a similar fashion, if you include any population along any axis of diversity, it's, it's often seen as an equity issue, namely that it's not fair to exclude people. And I agree that it's not fair, but I, I also argue that it's, we're the ones who benefit by inclusion of a diverse population. So to be somewhat blunt about it, your talented people can do well in many disciplines. I don't really worry about them all that much. I think it's not fair, but I don't really worry about that much. So we exclude them from ours, we just lose them to somebody else, right? So even in our self interest, I, I think that inclusion of diverse populations along any axis is beneficial. So I'm gonna stop there with my original, my initial remarks and see if there are any comments or questions. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll ask a question sure. just to kick things off. Um, can you can you say something about uh, like made? So you, you talked about how there have been, you know, significant major changes uh, in the ways in which undergraduates are a part of the research math research community now. Or this was not this was not the case. I don't know, thirty or forty years ago. What what were some of the the tipping points or moments whenever you knew that um, this wasn't just something around the edges, but this was a real cultural shift. So th there were these groups of people. I'll, I'll start with the, what I, who I call the pioneers. Um, and these people were like Robbie Robeson, Joe Gallion. Um, they, they started, somebody mentioned that in, in yes, I think it was on the Tarek's uh, panel where somebody's gotta be first, right? Somebody's gotta have that, the courage to go first. Um, so there was a group of people who went first um, and they started, they started the fire. Um, then there's a whole group of other people who I, to use, can use that analogy, poured the gasoline on the fire. And so a lot of those people were actually presenting at this conference. Um, they, Dennis Davenport, Deanna Hansberger, Herbert Medina, Eva Luce Rubio, and they really got this going. Um, you know, there's, there's this thing called the Roman rule. The Roman rule says that um, anybody who thinks that something sh can't be done should stay out of the way of people who are actually doing it. And um, and these people actually did it. And so um, th that really lit, um, I, I think that really lit the fire of, or, or expanded the fire of, um, and then people, other people started doing it. Right, so you know, it's not—it's not even just a proof of concept. They just actually did it, and and they did it out of—I I can't think of a better word. But they did it out of love, right? I mean, they didn't know they didn't have to do this, all right. I don't think anybody got any points for doing this. Um, in fact, they probably got criticism for doing it in, in many cases. Um, and so I think that um, you know, and then there's—I told you about the research conference. I, Emily and Kenny and I have this argument where. I think she's the one who started. She started this conference in the Hudson River Valley where it was run by undergraduates, right? And they would present and they would be, they would introduce that faculty would present also, but you would have the undergraduates. So it was really an undergraduate driven conference. They would be the moderators. I mean, if you didn't know, sometimes you can tell by age, you didn't know who the undergraduates were and who the, 
who the faculty were. And so they were really incorporated into the system. So I think, you know, these combination, and then they started presenting it at regular conferences. So I think, you know, once that happened, we saw and continue to see that, that expansion. So I think those are like the three tipping points for me. Yeah, so uh, if, if there has been a, 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 a massive market change in um, the ways in which undergraduates engage in research, um, what, are the, what are the innovations that you have seen in the way in which graduates, graduate programs, like what has been the biggest innovation in graduate education and mathematics in the last 25 or 30 years? Or if there hasn't been, uh, what is uh, what is it primed? What is what revolution is are we on the cusp of? I wish we were on the cusp of a revolution. You know, I you know um, this sort of came up with with um, I came up doing one of the panels a couple of days ago. I think it was um, Judy Walker. Judy Walker was talking about um, so amazing. Wow, she was a graduate student forty years ago. Um, I started graduate school this fall in 1972. So that's 49 years ago. Guess what they were talking about then? Diversifying graduate education. We're still talking about it. Almost 50 years, we're still talking about it. Why are we still talking about it? I mean, I'm glad you guys are doing it. Why are we still talking about it? Why is this, is this an intractable problem that we can't solve? You know, you know, my issue is if mathematicians can't solve this problem, what hope is there for the rest of society? You know. We have the tools, we have the thinking, the, 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 you know, the mathematical thinking to be able to figure this out. And we have it. So the only thing I, you know, I can think of is that we don't want to. I mean, that, that obviously everybody here does, but I mean, the, the generally speaking, you know, we don't, I don't, I, I just don't see that it's, it's systematically changing. I don't see it systematically, the numbers have increased but systematically, I haven't seen the change in, in almost 50 years. Yeah, so that that makes me wonder how how have there been how has it been possible that there have been systematic changes sort of at the undergraduate research level, and and not at the not at the graduate level where people feel like they're still scratching their heads about this. Uh, this tough problem, where whereas you know, there's just been this tremendous sea change in growth um, at, at the undergraduate level. Are there systemic, different systemic barriers? Is there a, is it harder to to galvanize support um, at, at the at the graduate level? Uh, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, you know, like what Dick McGee he said earlier about about what he did. That was very strategic. Right? So, you know, there's this power structure, and he used the power structure to for good. You know, I think about, you know, I grew up watching, um, reading comic books and, you know, there's, there are all these, these superheroes, but there are all these super villains too. And you, and they, and, and the super villains are, are really pretty intelligent and they're, some of them have powers and you kind of wonder, you know, if they could only use their stuff for good, you know, they really would be better off, but, you know, they, they change to use their stuff for evil. Um, you know, I'm not getting too carried away here, but it's, it's, that's not evil, but, it, but, you know, some people are benefited by the status quo, right? Um, even us, you know, you know, when you when you talk to people, what do you do for? I'm a mathematician, right? What kind of reaction do you get? Right? Some people will say, "Oh, I hate math." This to your face. They know you're a mathematician. I hate math, right? They say it to your face. Well, I'm glad they say it to your face, but you know, it's you know, they they're bold enough. Some people will even brag about. I was never good at math. Who would brag about, I, I can't, I'm illiterate. You know, I can't, I don't know how to read or write. You know, people wouldn't do that, but but they think nothing about, um, so, there's, so, there's, so there's a problem in the overall culture, right, about mathematics, but there's also a problem within mathematics itself. If you don't believe, if you get that reaction that um, I'm not good at math. So if you're good at math, you're considered to be smart. Right, you're a smart person because you're good at math. Because I'm not. Right, you know, people say I'm not good at math. You're, you must be pretty smart. Well, you know, this is sort of like sharing the power. Like, 
you 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 sort of have to give up the fact that you're really smart. You know, if you really believe, as many of us do, that anybody can do mathematics, well, then maybe you're not so smart anymore. So you sort of have to give up the idea that the automatic um, you're a smart person because you do math to believe that everybody can actually do math. So I I think there's a problem among and you know and Dick talked about this even in his apartment about uh, how people view it as this list of math, but you know, there's this rank ordered list of, you know, who's good in math, you know, not, not everybody can be good in math, not everybody's the same in math. Um, so I, I just think it's, there are more barriers. Um, and and it's just, that's what that's what makes it a harder problem. Yeah, that, that makes me wonder, like, is it a, is, is it harder, is it harder to give, or is it easier to give up that power or that sense of smartness? to a bunch of undergraduates who are maybe still more on the, on the outside of, of academic rings? Uh, or is it the people who are in those positions um, where maybe they aren't at PhD granting universities where they're, they're oriented in a, in a different way towards power structures or what their role is as mathematicians? Um, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to connect your observations about um, like broad math culture, including in, you know, broad, broad societal understanding of math culture um, with this, uh, how, how REUs and grad school have evolved differently in, in the last number of decades. Yeah, I mean, somebody has to do this, right? So, so the reason that it happened in undergrad, with undergraduates is that there are people willing to do this. Um, and then that sort of grew, it became a critical mass. And I, and I just don't think, that were there in graduate. I don't think I don't think it's impossible. I just think there's not that same level of commitment for lack of a better term. Um, I see how Matt has his hand raised. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, tie together uh, the you know, something tie back the the conversation currently with something you said earlier. Of if you know if mathematicians can't solve this problem, you know, who can? And I, I was in the, the uh, sort of interesting position because my, many of people in my family are economists of watching the economics profession have an internal debate uh, about why uh, there's so much toxicity in economics. Uh, and uh, at more or less the same time that the mathematics uh, community uh, was having uh, the sort of contention that was generated by uh, Abby Thompson's letter about diversity statements. And I was really struck by the extent to which the mathematicians uh, who, you know, as, as brilliant at the, as they are at mathematics, um, really didn't have tools to study a social problem. Hmm. And so the economists, it was very interesting. You know, some of those people are, are pretty, uh, pretty unpleasant people, but they have a lot of training about how to study human behavior, uh, you know, maybe in a narrower point of view than the full spectrum of social scientists, but they were really turning their research methods, uh, research methods that had been somehow verified in on themselves, and they were learning some interesting things. Now, some, of peop some people in the profession have been doing work like that for decades, and I sort of wonder, because you have a lot of perspective watching different, uh, different, um, uh, groups conduct research on on this kind of topic. I wonder, are there uh, are there sort of schools of research people people who study, for example, change theory and things like that that we should be uh, turning to 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 learn how uh, to do this work more effectively? I, I think that's true, Matt. Um, so I'm often amazed at how how mathematicians are, have Many mathematicians have the ability to partition the way they think. They, they, they will use their mathematical techniques for mathematics, but when you move it to another area, they don't use those same techniques, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'll go back to, to Dick McGee, what he said, you know, the, some of the things that his faculty were saying, like, I mean, really a mathematician thinks that way about I mean, I just, it, it just amazes me. Um, so maybe, you know, that's probably true. Man. We probably need to um, collaborate with other groups um, 
so that we can tie, you know, you know, our way of thinking with their way of thinking, and, and sort of somehow come up with a, you know, solution to all of this. I, I, I mean, there aren't any particular groups that I know of, but um, but I think, I, I think that's that would go a long way to help us get to where we need to go. We want to go. Yeah. Thanks, Lloyd. Okay, um, Robbie. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, go for it. If you see something in the chat. I saw Robbie's uh, call. Yeah, you're you're right. It's not unique at all. It's not the compartmentalization. It's not unique to mathematicians, but um, maybe I expect more mathematicians. Uh, so, Lou, let me ask you this question from the Slido uh, that was submitted anonymously: uh, Are 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 reuse inclusive enough currently? Is not that... enough and there aren't enough of them right so um yeah i just don't think you know you know it's it's a problem right so i'm not going to give anybody an, an out for uh, for a hard it's a hard problem um but yeah i don't i don't think they're inclusive enough um you know um during your introduction to me you mentioned that i'm i'm a pi on this nreup and we have really good numbers for minorities students because we cheat for lack of a better term we we have faculty find them for us so our so our numbers are, are pretty close to 100 percent um there are issues i suppose if you're running an reu if you can even ask um somebody for what their ethnicity is right so so the way we do it in our program is it's all personal content Right, you know, you know, we, we work with faculty who know, and this is sort of how the math alliance did it. Also, you know, it's, they worked with individuals who knew minorities were, and encouraged them to apply. Um, yeah, I don't, but I, but the answer, sure answer to that question is no. I don't think that. Yeah, just to uh, hone in on one of the things you said here uh, just now, because I, I know this is something that people who are organizing an REU for the first time bump up against where they want to be mindful and of, of issues of diversity. Then they want to serve, you know, in, you know, in, in small numbers, uh, cause they're only dealing with small numbers, but to, to serve people broadly. Right. Um, but they, they run into, uh, institutional barriers like within their own university or within whatever system people are applying through, of uh, being able to to identify folks who might be able to particularly benefit from the opportunity that they're offering um do you have do you have thoughts or experiences on like uh for people who don't have cheat codes right who you know who aren't the maa what, what's your advice for how to um for an, an individual reu to um to find recruit uh identify um potential participants yeah I, I think it's the personal contact i think uh, you have to go out there you have to go to field of dreams you have to go to stock i mean you just i mean uh, nam math nam math fest um you just have to go it, it's work right it's work. and then there's also and this is not to be understated um it, let's say you could in a perfect world you could ask people you know what their what their ethnicity is what their race is some people don't want to tell you because they don't want you to know what are you going to use this information for you, you know there's this distrust that you may be using it you say you're using it for one particular purpose but maybe you're saying that because you want to exclude me right so um and this goes back in going back to what dick mcgee said you know, you know how far down the list do you have to go so people are there's a, there's also a matter of distrust so again i have to go back to the, the personal contact you have to build it. Um, you have to build the trust. You have to do the one-on-one -on -one contact, and, and it's a lot of work. And then that's again, that's why I applaud these people who were, who have have done the undergraduate research um, inclusion. So here's a here's another question from the Slido. We we talked some earlier, and Matt had brought up about other about other fields and uh, their experiences or initiatives. In promoting diversity inside of those fields, um, are there are there particular ideas that um, you've seen happen in other disciplines 
that either, um, oh, in, in terms of diversifying those disciplines, that either took off in ways that, um, that haven't taken off in math or that were just tried there um, and, and haven't been tried in math, you know, maybe in other STEM subjects, biology or physics or so forth, or, or maybe even things further afield. Yeah, are there just, are, are there ideas that we're not having as a, as a field or are there ideas that we're not trying out but could be or just not implementing well? Um, I, just, I just got distracted by math and that's a question. Um, yeah, yeah, and the other side, in the lab sciences, um, you know they, they do it in the lab sciences, but we don't have labs right that much, right? So that's so that's a so that's a challenge. Um, yeah, it's really hard to do. You know, you know. I think again, the personal contact, the welcoming environment. I, I don't. I don't think we have a welcoming environment, right? So, so. Um, Yeah, I, I know. All right, so let's talk about the fact that um, we're talking about underrepresentation, right? So I'm going to use women as an example, right? So um, you know, I go back to my days at NSF. You know, women are not considered minorities for the simple reason that there are more women than there are men. So you can't be a minority because there are more of you, right? But they're definitely underrepresented, right? So the number of women in mathematics is, is, is relatively small, right? So if they're underrepresented, in mathematics, they must be overrepresented somewhere else, right? So why is that? Where are those places and why is that? Is it because they feel more welcome than those places or is it because they feel rejected or unwelcome in places where they aren't? Neither one of those is good, right? So um, at least for us, neither one of those is good. Um, so I think, you know, who wants to be in an unwelcoming environment? So I think um, somehow, first of all, we have to become one, and then, so then we have to get the word out that we are. Right? So I think that it, it's a multi-step process. Um, I mean, I know I know people who have, who have um, um, part of my checkered history is that I used to work for a Wall Street law firm, and um, I know people who leave math to go into law. Like, really? Do you think law is a welcoming environment? Who thinks law is a welcoming environment? Yet, that's the case, right? So I have um, I have a um, orthopedic surgeon who um, went to one of these specialized schools in New York in, in, in the city of Man in borough Manhattan. If you're from New York, you know which one I'm talking about. And he he's told me math was his first love. And math was his first love. He always loved math. He was in the math club at this high school and he was the number three person. And he knew, who, he told me who number one and number two were. And I, if I told you who they were, you'd know who they were too. So that even in high school, they were really good. He was so turned off by the fact that they were, um, by who they were that he decided to go to med school. And so even though his first love was math, he decided to choose another, and he's a white male, right? So, I mean, you know, we're good at rejecting whole lots of people, right? So. And making what making them feel unwelcome. So, yeah, I just think we 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 just need to make it make a better place for people who want to be. Yeah, that makes me wonder about. So you you use the language of of being a welcoming place, and when when I hear that, I think, or and I think lots of people, the kinds of images that get conjured up are, you know, like a social event or you know, uh, a place where when you walk down the hall, you don't immediately avert your eyes from the, the person who's walking down, but you like want to say the hello to them. Um, but over and above having places that are welcoming, it seems uh, very important to have, a, you know, institutions and also a profession um, that's like has a plausible path forward, right? Where like, it's, it's fine if, if a place like puts out the cookies on the visiting day, um, but if, you know, if, if I'm going to become a lawyer, like, I, you know, you might think, oh, I'll be able to get a job as a lawyer. But if you're like, uh, will I be able to be, be a mathematician? Or is like every step of the way going to be extremely precarious and people trying to push me 
at least, at least uh, you know, institutionally wise, if not personally, pushing me out of pushing me out of the pipeline. Um, so I, I think I, I wonder about this from the standpoint of um, you know the the kinds of resources that uh, we know will be available to us as we we go through a, an academic career path or a research career path, um, and also uh, that the amount of precarity folks are willing to to experience in order to to move forward along that path. You know, a lawyer they're taking out a ton, taking up tons of debt up front, but then expect to be able to pay that off. Whereas in grad school in math, you're taking on a different kind of debt, right? In order to like maybe be able to pay it off. But I feel a lot less confident that people in general are gonna be able to, to pay off that initial uh, out outlay in math graduate school. And that, that seems like a, that seems like a, a real barrier. So, I, you know, I, you raise a good point about what do people do after grad school, right? So um, there are lots of jobs that people can have with math backgrounds that pay lots of money, right? But are they directed that way, right? Or are they considered to be a failure if they don't go into certain careers, right? So I think, um, I think that's that that's part of the environment. Right? I think it's there are people. There are people. Obviously, I mean, I'm generalizing. I, I probably shouldn't generalize, but um, there there are there are people who who direct their students who don't think of them as failures if they choose a different profession than their professors do. But there are a lot of people who do. Right? And so I think you know that's part of the environment. And and if you think about this, okay. So if you if you um, if you're a math faculty member. And your goal is to replace yourself, all right? So in a sense, replacing yourself by getting people other academic jobs. How many students, if you have, I'm making this up, if you have a 30-year career, how many students do you have to put in that direction to be successful? Well, my argument at the end, the number is one, right? Because that's only, you're only replacing one person. Even if you were at a very small liberal arts college, I, I would get guess in a 30-year career you have more than one student. Where do the rest of them go? Right. So they all have to go somewhere. And if, if, if there are mathematicians all over the place, you know, they, they hide. I mean, they're not even called mathematicians, um, but they use their math background that they learn at our academic institutions to go on to do other things. And I think some of them get there by accident um, and they're not necessarily directed. Um, so that's sort of my answer. But there are a couple of things in the chat that I would like to respond to. Um, Sid, he, I think, is, is, if I'm pressing your name correct. Um, there, are, there are a lot of people um, who actually do think about who can benefit most from participating in the program, um, as opposed to the, the quote, best student. I and mean, I think a couple of, they mentioned this yesterday in, in the panel where um, Deanna and Herbert and, and, and Ivelisse were, um, but yeah, I, I, that has always been a tension among REUs. Um, who do we admit? And do you, who would benefit from the most or who the quote, you know, best student would be? Um, and Joe says, I agree with what Joe says about talking to Students, staff, faculty at HBCUs, tribal colleges, universities, HSI, talk about students um, with strengths and weaknesses and support the ones that they want. Oh. Um. And Morris says, talk, talks about um, the prevalence of the belief that math is objective, if that's a meritocracy. Yeah, I thought that too, by the way. I, I, that, they sucked me into that one. Um, yeah, that's, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of, I guess the irony is that's sort of why I, I, one of the reasons I went into math is because I thought it was a meritocracy. Um, but, you know, I found out otherwise. But it's okay. Yeah. Well so speaking of meritocracy 
and just thinking about your long experience at the NSF, I, I want, could you talk some from that perspective about the role that funding and grants plays in this understanding of, you know, mathematicians being linearly ordered and like, uh, you know, we're only gonna, there was some comment, I think, during the conference about, oh, well, it, a minimum hiring requirement of like having an NSF grant, like what is, what are both mm. the, the, the pros and cons or like the sides of the coins of, of trying to promote mathematical research through funding and also like making sure this doesn't fall into um, false notions of uh, who, who, who is good enough. Good, good question, tough question. Um, it, it always amazed me um, that people would say, um, I need to get an NSF grant, otherwise I'm not gonna get tenure. And well, that's true or not, you know, I don't know that that's true or not, but it, it amazes me that any academic institution would let somebody from the outside determine who their lifelong colleague is going to be. Right? I mean, I wouldn't want somebody else telling me, um, making that determination for me. I think there are a lot of other things that go into who you want to be a lifelong colleague with, besides whether they can get funding from an external agency. Um, I think, I dare say that we all know some people who are probably really good at grants who you, you wouldn't want to be working with. And so it, it is, you know, it's a two-edged sword. Um, you know, um, getting funding is great, but, but it's not everything. And, and easy for me to say, but, um, you know, if you've been applied to NSF and you have got, not gotten a grant, you might have a different opinion about that. It's just okay. Yeah, let me uh, turn our attention to a question from over in the Slido. Uh, someone has anonymously asked, uh, should we expect math faculty to have some degree of expertise um, in issues related to equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, as a requirement in hiring? I wouldn't say expertise, I would say, um... openness, right? There aren't, there aren't a whole lot of people who are EDI experts and you can't expect everybody to be one, but people should certainly be open to EDI issues. You shouldn't be, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on Dick McGee, he, but, but he brought it up. Um, you shouldn't be like his faculty who, who think that um, because, you, because you admit either an applicant, a grad student, undergrad, faculty member, um, of, of a certain ethnicity or a certain diversity component that you're, you're going down the list and you, you're not picking the best. I just think people need to be open to that. Um, here's, a, here's another question from over in the Slido. Uh, this one's from Hiro Lee Tanaka. Uh, Hiro says, uh, I asked this of Shirley Malcolm as well, who was a plenary speaker in the in the spring. Um, having worked since you've worked with people outside of math, Lloyd, um, and who have been making important decisions either at the NSF or at their universities, how do people outside of math view diversity issues in math? Do they like just think we're like one more like one more STEM field like physics or or whatever? that has struggles or are there particular elements or impacts of diversity in math in particular that, that stand out um, like more widely and amongst other fields? Um, Hero, thanks for that question. I, I, think, I think it's very similar. I, you know, when, when we go back to the issue of undergraduates, um, I remember how the, the, at NSF, we were, were on the same floor as a physicist because we're on the, um, same directorate, um, we were in the same floor. And so they would laugh at us for the number of RE sites that we had, because we had very few at that time. 
and they would have pictures of all their and they're saying, you know, you guys, you guys only think you, that you're really interested in the graduate education and in the graduate research, but you're not really because look, you know, look at, you know, we have these 25 sites and you've got like four. So, um, so you guys don't really take this seriously. And, and you know, at the time I, I had inherited the program, I, I, I couldn't argue with them because, you know, the numbers were there. Right? And, and I think um, other STEM fields, um, it's the same issue. Biology, by the way, does not have this, does not have the women problem, right? They may have other problems, but biology doesn't have the women problem, right? So um, math can look pretty bad, actually. Engineers have the problem. Mathematicians have the problem. Physicists have the problem. Astronomers probably have a bigger problem. They're a smaller community, though. So I guess those other fields over the course of time, when, when you're talking about at the NSF where you had four and they had 25, um, did, their, did their impressions change as the number of sites grew? Yeah, well, they couldn't, you know, numbers, the, the numbers are there, right? They couldn't say anything more. They didn't, they didn't, they, they didn't say anything, okay? So, you know, I would walk by, I just walk by, I'd just say hi, they wouldn't say anything, because they couldn't, they couldn't say it anymore. Yeah. I didn't rub it in their faces, I just said hi. You know, that. That's very, that's very gracious of you. <laughs> I try to be. Yeah. Um, so Joe um, talks about training grants. Um, um, so Joe, could you are you talking about um, grad students, undergrads? So NIH has a whole structure uh, uh -huh. for training grants um, that starts at like the high school level that goes all the way up through uh, grad school. And, um, I have one of them, so it's like why I know a little more than I should. But mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of initiatives within the training grants um, from the schools that that I feel that NSF and um, the graduate departments can learn from um, that are they're doing to help diversify their programs. Um, I'll, I can, I'll drop a link in the chat for if people are curious about what those are, uh, that structure is. But again, it goes from high school all the way through grad school, postdocs. That's good. Um, well, so, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I'll drop the link it's for people to help if they've never seen it before. So, you know, Division of Mathematical Sciences does have um, training grants at, at, the, at, but at the graduate level. Um, trying to think if there are others, if there are other people who are familiar with other NSF grants, but I know at the graduate level in mathematics. Are these the, um, these the RTG? RTG, yeah, yeah. Let's see, oh, oh okay. I thought that wasn't a, a question by Hero, but yes, that's correct. That's absolutely a good idea. Volunteer to become a review panelist for NSF programs. You can affect funding decisions for the community. And um, David's question, not career stage or career type requirements to be an SF reviewer, no. Well, career stage. I don't think we've had undergraduates or graduate students. Um, yet, yet. <laughs> yet, yet. I, you know, I hesitated before. Postdocs can do it, absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. Well, let, let me ask Lloyd. Um, so you've been um, you've been away from the NSF for what maybe ten or fifteen years now. Are there way, the the continuation? I'm not asking you to you know critique or judge or laud or, or anything. Go but, ahead. Go ahead. But, but, uh, you know, you you, uh, you had you had your hands in that work for for many years, and you've seen how it's evolved since then. Are, are there things? That are happening at the NSF that you're particularly excited about, or how you know things that you would want to project further into the future that you hope that the NSF will either continue doing, or ways in which its role can continue to help the the cause of having an inclusive math research community. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think NSF is really good at a lot of things, um, and and I particularly like. 
you know, this goes sort of back to what you said about um, what the mathematicians do after grad school, um, working with other disciplines. I, you know, we all talk about how universal mathematics is. Um, and there are people who, who sort of cross the line, but I, but I think that the more, um, so, so a twofold thing. So the more mathematicians work in other disciplines, I, I think that broadens the mathematicians. I think it, it helps the other disciplines, but also help, helps the other disciplines appreciate the mathematicians and the mathematics, right? So, um, you know, we all think mathematics is important. We know it's important, but it's important for me I, to have other people think that also. And it's also, it's important for, it's, it's good um, to use Monica Cox's term to have um, accomplices. Right, so um, people in other disciplines making your case for you is better than you make trying to make your own case. This is even true when it comes to funding. Um, you know, medical medicine gets a lot of funding, but I don't think that people know much more about medicine than they know about mathematics. They do think it's important, right? We want people to think that mathematics is important. Not just because we're mathematicians, because it really is important, right? So you don't have to be a mathematician, but you can know it's important, and that sort of gives it generates public support for for mathematics. Yeah, let me let me ask another. Um, uh, it, it, It'll come from the standpoint of talking about the NSF, but but I I, I mean it more broadly. So um, one thing that caught my attention only recently, but I, I think it's new, is that the, um, the 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 mathematical sciences part of the NSF is having these these online office hours where people can drop mm -hmm. in and, and and ask things. And maybe that existed before zoom and so forth um mm -hmm. but uh it's it's a, it's a question of how people it's help, helping people to become involved maybe, maybe with the the nsf in particular but I, in in math initiatives in general like becoming uh not just a member of the ams but uh like a like a like a contributor or being being involved i think this is a a tough problem that all kinds of organizations have in terms of how do you do how do you do outreach to one's members or one's natural member base? Uh, do you have uh, thoughts or advice, maybe specific to the NSF, but, but but maybe more broadly as well, of how institutions can be better at drawing people into their work, and also for maybe young people especially, how to become more connected and involved in the work of the the wider math community? Um, so specifically, I think the office hours are a great idea. I, you know, one of the things when I worked at NSF, um, you know, I did a lot of outreach myself, but I had a really hard time um, getting people to talk to me. And I would encourage it. I mean, I would tell them, you know, talk to me. You know, talk to me. Well, and then I'd ask them, people say, well, we don't want to talk to you. Go, okay, why? Why do you want to talk to me? Well, we don't want to bug you. Well, okay, you can. You don't have to bug me, you know, but you can talk to me, right? So it's better, some people, I don't I don't know, you can. You guys can tell me what the view of NSF is, but so some somebody, people have the view of this NSF as this place where, you know, you have these program officers who don't, you're only looking for any excuse to, to, to you know, decline your proposal and you don't want to talk to them because you know they're unapproachable um and some people and and so i think people a lot of people had that opinion and i have to really make a concerted effort to have people to try to talk and so you should talk there's things you should you shouldn't bug your program officer or any program officer but you should talk to them i mean it, it's better to know um to talk to them than not if, it's, if you have a question like if there's a solicitation that you don't understand um you know ask them you know they're actually human beings you know I mean, they'll they'll talk to you um i'll add to that that what i've heard and i uh, heard is that the program officers are really encouraged to get to know the mathematicians 
in the mathematical community. And uh, the ones I know all take that uh, pretty serious. And they actually, as, as Lloyd has just expressed, they're happy when they get to talk to a mathematician on the phone that they haven't talked to before. Yeah. I mean, I talk to a lot of people. I, like, I go around to conferences. I go to JMM or MathFest, and, and I'd walk around looking at people's name tags because there are people who, I, who I'd emailed and talked to for years that I've never met in person. And then I'd meet them and go, oh, you're so-and-so. So it was always a good thing. Um, I, I see that uh, Hang Lu made the, has a comment. Um, it was hard to figure out when, you, when she was talking to people versus bugging them. Um, I, it, yeah, that's, I, you know, I get that. Um, But, um, you know, it's, okay, so you're not a student anymore, but put yourself out there. And I think people will tell you if they're not, if you're bugging them, right? Maybe I'll get, I'll get that. They'll and find out if you this, this is something where I think um, for the, the senior mathematicians on the phone, uh, on, the, on the meeting, it's something where the senior mathematicians can help. You know, you, so you have a, a new mathematician in your, uh, in your department. You can make the call to the program officer with, uh, with a new faculty member or postdoc in the room and introduce them to each other. Yeah, and that, that, can, uh, that, that, that kind of social help, uh, I think, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, very, very useful to uh, early career people. In, in chemistry, where the American Chemical Society uh, is a much larger and, uh, uh, organization than, than the AMS, they, they actually have programs where they introduce a few, I mean, I, I, I think it's not large enough for the size of the chemistry community, but they actually have a, business, a, a program where they bring in early career researchers in chemistry and take them over to the NSF to introduce them to their program officers. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe's comment about, um getting things changed, right? So, you know, NSF has these program solicitations, but, you know, we want, you know, I can't say we anymore. They want to hear from what's, what's working, what's not working, right? So um, Joe mentioned the thing about, um, they were pushing for part-time students. It used to, the SDEM uh, grant used to require students to be full-time. You know, they pushed for it and they got changed, you know? Um, there are certain things that can be changed and some things that can't. And, then, and, and the things that can't be changed, all right, so let's talk about things that can't be changed, right? So, you know, NSF is a bureaucracy. It's a federal agency. Um, there are lots of rules. Um, but, but the thing about a federal agency is if there are rules, they're all written down somewhere. So it's either in the U.S. Constitution, it's a law, it's a, it's a, a policy statement, um, it's in a program solicitation, and but they're all written down somewhere. So people will make up rules that don't exist. And what's, what always amazed me, people will make up rules to their detriment. I mean, I can see people making up rules for their advantage, but they make it to their detriment. So somebody would say to me, oh, we can't do that because there's a rule against it. I said, okay, really? Where's the rule? All right, because they're all written down somewhere. And they said, well, you know, I heard that this, okay, where's the rule? And they said, well, okay, maybe it's not a rule. Okay, but it's not a rule, it means you don't have to do it, all right? So, so we talk about you know, creativity and what can be changed. Program offers have a lot of latitude to do things because the rules give them a lot of latitude, right? So there's a lot of things that you can do that don't require even a rule change. It can be a practice change. I'm, you know, I have people tell me, well, we've always done it that way. Well, well that's never a good answer. We've always done it that way. And we've always done that way and it's not a rule, then you can, you don't have to do it that way. And also I just find out they haven't always done it that way. You know, they did it the last two times and the, and, a, and the 50 times before that it was done a different way, right? So, you know, again, challenge people. If there's, there's a rule, it's gotta be written down somewhere. So. Yeah, maybe let's uh, let, let Todd. Ahead. Let's let Todd's question here in the chat be um, a one, the one last question for our, our one hour time. Was, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Okay. Uh, do you think there is anything about how we as mathematicians like to approach problems that is detrimental to our efforts to create a diverse, welcoming, equitable math community? Yeah, I think um, 
if you approach problems to that there's only one answer or there's one, only one method to get an answer, um, I think that that's detrimental. But, you know, again, this is one of these weird things. How many times have you come across multiple proofs to a theorem, right? Again, that's, that's one of those things that as mathematicians, we do that. You can, somebody writes a proof, somebody writes another proof. Different approach proves the same theorem. How come we can't do that in other things, right? So again, it's, it's, it's a thing about what my, my saying about the mathematicians apply to certain things to mathematics, but not necessarily to other things. And Debbie says that sometimes rules can be changed, yes. And that's absolutely true as she knows. <laughs> <laughs>